The next section of this chapter is all about health promotion and illness prevention. And we're going to be looking at this through the lens of health psychology. Health psychology is the area of psychology that's concerned with studying psychological and behavioral factors and how they affect the prevention and treatment of illness and in our maintenance of health. Health psychology recognizes that behavior plays an important role in maintaining health. At the start of this section in the textbook, there's a quote uh, attributed to Knowles back in 1977, where they say that over 99% of us are born healthy and made sick as a result of personal misbehavior and environmental conditions. Now, I don't know about the accuracy of 99%, but it kind of makes sense that most of us come into the world with no major health problems. But over time, because of things that we're exposed to, because of our behaviors and our environment, we come to experience different health factors. Now, we might know that there are also going to be biological predispositions and sometimes even genetic components that mean that we're going to have a particular disease or um, il uh, illness or problem of some sort. Um, but a lot of the things driving this are behavioral and environmental factors. And we can actually see this, uh, this attribution if we look at these two graphs here. And so these are comparing the top killers of humanity in the 1900s and again in 2017. So in 1900, most people in the world were dying from things like influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, gastrointestinalitis, diarrhea, uh, heart disease, things that are, you know, probably due to poor health care and things that they've been exposed to in their environment. But if we look at nowadays, or at least as close as 2017, Top reasons for death include cancer, cardiovascular disease, accidents, stroke, respiratory uh, disease. A lot of these modern causes of death are going to be more attributable to health endangering behaviors. So cardiovascular disease might be coming from smoking, uh, accidents from how we drive and what we're doing in the car. Things like diabetes might be due to our diet. So we're seeing a lot more of behavior influencing things that are leading to death versus earlier on, it used to be infectious diseases or lack of exposure to healthcare. So we're seeing a shift where behavior is having more and more of an important role in our health. And so if we want to talk about health-related behaviors, we can talk about them in two broad categories health-enhancing behaviors and health-compromising behaviors. So health-enhancing behaviors, as you might expect, are going to maintain or increase our health. Things like exercising, eating healthy, uh, safe sexual practices, re regular medical checkups, breast and testicular self-examinations, things that you can do to try and maintain or enhance your health. Health compromising behaviors are things that promote the development of illness, things that are going to cause a decrease in our health. Smoking, diets that are heavy in fats, living a sedentary lifestyle, and unprotected sexual activity, these are all things that can cause harm to our health. Now, if we want to push ourselves, if we want to have more of those health-enhancing behaviors, if we want to be more healthy and we want to live longer, healthier lives, we're going to want to have more of these health-enhancing behaviors and fewer of the health-compromising behaviors. So maybe we should understand a little bit about what drives people to change what kind of behaviors they're enacting. What makes people more likely to have health-conscious behaviors and less health-hindering behaviors? One of the major ways of thinking about this kind of change is through the trans-theoretical model. This was proposed by Prochaska and de Clement in the 1980s, and it was basically a way to try and figure out 
what processes are occurring that gets people to modify their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in more positive ways. And this can be either independently or with professional help. But they identified six major stages that seem to happen as people change the way that they think and then behave, especially as it relates to health. Now, unlike some other stages, it's important to note that the authors of this model didn't specify that people had to progress through the six stages in a orderly sequence. People don't necessarily start at stage one and move smoothly through to stage six, following each of them in a logical, predictable pattern. People can move back and forth between stages, they can move ahead, they can revert. Um, it's not always going to be one, then two, then three, and so on. And what usually happens is that people start going through this model, they'll get through the first couple of stages, and then maybe they'll suffer some setbacks. They want to eat healthier, but they can't maintain it, so they'll revert and they'll start over. Um, and so usually, for someone to successfully change their behavior, they're going to go through this model a couple of times before they do it successfully. So keep all of that in mind as we talk about these different stages. So the first stage we want to talk about is pre-contemplation. So this is the stage where people have no desire to change. They deny that their behavior has any kind of negative consequences, or maybe they even feel helpless to change. There's nothing I can do. Uh, maybe someone is smoking, and they really don't want to stop smoking. They enjoy the effects they get from it. They don't think it's having a massive negative effect on them. It's fine. The next stage is contemplation. So they start to realize that maybe there is a problem. They start developing this desire for change. So again, as a smoker, maybe people are aware that there are health risks associated with smoking, but it hasn't been a problem yet. People won't leave this stage of contemplation until the benefits of making that change start outweighing the risk of not making the change. So maybe you start experiencing more shortness of breath, and that's going to push you to say, hey, maybe I should try and stop smoking because it's starting to impact my health. Next, you move on into preparation. So this is when you develop a plan of action. You start identifying the conditions that are going to be affecting your behavior. So maybe you start realizing that you smoke more when you're around friends that also smoke. So maybe you want to avoid spending time with them for a little while while you get ready or prepare to stop smoking. Find other ways to get around it. Have a plan of action. Maybe start smoking fewer cigarettes. You're getting ready to move forward. That brings us to step four, which is action, where you actively start modifying the behavior or your environment. This is the stage that requires the greatest commitment. This is when you actually have to step up and start doing it. Up until this point, you haven't really acted on anything. But once you've gotten to this point, once, again, with the smoking example, you've decided to take action, you've decided that you're stopping smoking, you've committed. And whether or not you succeed at this stage is going to depend on the tools that you have at your disposal. Do you have the kind of control skills necessary to stick to your plan? Once you been successful in avoiding relapse or re-experiencing the behavior that you're trying to avoid, once you have this controlled, uh, targeted behavior, so you're no longer smoking for six months, we would say that you've entered the maintenance phase. So you've avoided relapse, you've controlled your target behavior, you've stopped smoking, now you're just maintaining. As you might uh, guess, people might lapse back into formal be or former behavior patterns during this stage. So they might have a moment of weakness. Maybe they have a really stressful week and just have one cigarette. Maybe one cigarette turns into two, turns into a lot. Um, so they might relapse and have to start all over again. Um, and the difference here between a lapse and a relapse is a lapse would be a single 
uh, faltering. So you smoke a single cigarette because you're having a terrible, terrible day. Something's gone horribly wrong and you just needed one cigarette. But then you go back to no longer smoking. That would be considered a lapse. If, instead, that one cigarette led to two, led to smoking a couple every day, that would be considered a relapse because you've gone back to old patterns of behavior. And for our last stage, this is sort of that idealized stage that everyone is striving for. This is to reach termination. This is the stage where you're no longer at risk of reverting to your old behaviors. This behavioral change is now ingrained. Maybe the thought of smoking now makes you nauseous. You would never, ever consider doing that again. It's not even a temptation. If you get to that point, you've reached termination and you have successfully changed your behavior. You've successfully moved to a more health conscious type of behavior. These graphs here are kind of a weird way of visualizing this, but we're looking at the relationship between the number of positive health practices that people are displaying and their longevity. And we've separated out based on males and females. So let's look at the male graph first. So along the bottom, we're looking at age in years. So younger through till older. Um, on this axis here, we're looking at proportion of individuals in that group who are dying during a five and a half year period. So the higher up on this uh, axis the bar is falling, the more people are dying in that, uh, in that age group per unit time, basically. Um, and so we can look at people who have zero to three health conscious practices, so good things that are improving their health. Uh, four to five is blue, six to seven is green. And so we should see that those with fewer health practices are going to be showing more of them dying at younger ages, um, basically because the line is on top. So people with fewer health practices die younger, um, and more of them are dying younger um, than in any of the other groups. So red is the fewest positive health practices, green is the most positive health practices, and we're seeing that those who are uh, red with few health practices die at a younger age. Um, and then if we just look at the difference between males and females, there's a larger increase in this area for males where more males tend to die younger, um, and especially in those who have fewer health practices at that point. So that's the information that these graphs are trying to get across. It's just not necessarily the clearest way the textbook could have done it. So Let's talk about some of the behaviors that can actively help us try and enhance or increase our health. One of the major ones is, of course, going to be exercise. Living a sedentary lifestyle is strongly associated with having health problems. Things like heart disease and obesity, you're at much higher risk of both of those, among other things, if you live a sedentary life. If you spend a lot of time uh, in front of a computer, at a desk, if you don't move around a lot, you're at higher risk for heart disease and obesity. When we're talking about exercises, we're usually going to be referring specifically to aerobic exercise. An aerobic exercise is going to be some kind of sustained activity, something like jogging or swimming or cycling. It's going to elevate your heart rate and increase your body's need for oxygen. So if you run on a treadmill, your heart beats faster, you breathe heavier because you're pulling in more oxygen. And moderate levels of exercise are going to produce the best results. If you don't work hard enough, you're not going to raise your heart rate, you're not going to pull in extra oxygen, you're not going to work your body. But also if you work too hard, you can overwork your body, you can cause injuries. So somewhere in the middle is best. And people who exercise regularly tend to be more physically healthy. They tend to live longer lives. And we can actually look at a graph from a specific study that was looking at people who either exercised very low amounts, medium amounts, or high amounts. Um, and again, we're looking at death rates. So per 10,000 people, how many in the study were dying? And we see that deaths are, again, a little bit higher in men than women. Um, and people in this low fitness group who are not exercising very much in their lives at all are having the highest death rates. 
um, our medium and high fitness category are actually pretty close to one another, which is kind of cool. Um, so you don't have to exercise a ton. You don't have to be uh, a bodybuilder or the best of the best in order to get the benefits of exercise. All right, well, how about instead of increasing behaviors that improve our health, instead of doing more exercise, what about considering the other side of things? What if we reduce behaviors that impair health? So we're still trying to improve our health, but in this case, we're trying to get rid of things that are negative for our health. For any kind of behavioral intervention where you're trying to get people to change their behavior, whether it's to increase beneficial behaviors like exercise or reduce uh, health impairing behaviors like having unprotected sex, all types of interventions are going to rely on a couple of factors. These behavioral interventions go better if someone is capable of self-monitoring or if they're given the, uh, the tools that aid them in self-monitoring. So specifically, you're looking for identi or they're looking to identify antecedents of behavior. Are there certain things, situations, environments that lead you to undertake an unhealthy behavior? If you can identify or self-monitor to figure out which situations trigger you to have bad behaviors, so maybe you only smoke in certain places, so you can identify those places as contributing to your continuing pattern of smoking. You also want to have a good self-regulation, and specifically self-regulation of your behaviors. If you're identifying that being in a specific environment is going to lead you to smoke, you have to change your behavior. You have to regulate your behavior so that maybe you don't go to those places. Try and help yourself to smoke less. People also tend to stick with things if they start seeing reinforcement for their successes. So if you're exercising and you start seeing the positive effects, you're looking toned, you're losing weight, you're feeling better, that's reinforcement for you to continue doing that behavior. You're going to keep exercising. If you stop smoking and your lungs don't hurt as much, you start having more energy, you're going to have more reinforcement to continue those behaviors. It leads to better success. But you have to get to the point where you can push past other factors uh, to get to that reinforcement. If you've ever tried to diet or exercise, you might have figured out that you don't immediately feel better. You don't immediately start losing weight. If anything, the first couple of workouts are going to make you feel worse. If anything, dieting for the first little while can end up leading to temporary weight gain. So. The success of behavioral interventions is also going to be contingent upon how you handle those setbacks. So maybe that ties back into self-regulation and maybe a little bit about personality too, where you can get through those to start seeing the benefits of your behaviors. But let's end this section off by delving a little bit more into a specific prevention program, specific way of getting people to stop doing health harmful behaviors. And we're going to use the situation of uh, AIDS. And AIDS is short for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. I always have to look it up. Um, but as you might know, there was quite the epidemic of AIDS in the recent past where it was becoming more and more common in a lot of different circles in different countries. And it was becoming such a widespread problem that there were programs put into effect to try and limit the spread of the disease. Now, you may know that AIDS was mostly spread through unprotected sex. So the goal of the prevention program was to try and get people to use condoms when engaging in sexual activity to try and reduce the spread of the disease. And so they found four basic features that would help in making this a successful prevention program. So the first of these features was education. So they would educate people. They would have advertisements um, telling people that 
AIDS was being caused by unprotected sex. So there is a risk if you engage in unprotected sex that you may end up exposed to this disease. So by educating people of the risks, they can be more informed of the situation. Our next feature is motivation. They wanted to try and motivate people to change their behavior. And in doing so, try and convince them that it's possible for them to do so. Give them sort of some incentive to try and motivate them to adjust their behaviors. Next stage was introduce specific guidelines. So not only tell people we want you to stop having unprotected sex, but give them guidelines for how they can change that risky behavior. Teach them the skills that they need for that change. And for the last one, give support and encouragement for the desired changes. You want to encourage or reinforce those good behaviors. Now, we're framing this in terms of the AIDS prevention programs, but these features can be involved in any kind of prevention program, whether you're trying to get people to stop smoking or stop doing drugs. All of these features, these basic features, are necessary or at least useful in trying to encourage people to change their behavior. Now, the textbook spends a whole lot more time talking about this specific case, but interesting to note that one of the major challenges that they face in this specific prevention program, but that seems to pop up in a lot of places, is the challenge of trying to get young adults or adolescents to change their behavior. And that's because a lot of uh, adolescents and young adults have this irrational sense of invulnerability. Maybe you can think back to our chapter about intelligence and development to explain some of those ideas, but teens and young adults basically felt like, well, AIDS isn't my problem. I could never get sick. It's never going to affect me. I'm invulnerable. I can't be harmed. And so because they have this sense of that's not a problem that affects me, they have no motivation to change their behavior. The education isn't helpful because they immediately dismiss it. And so successful prevention programs would somehow have to convince these adolescents and young adults that this is a problem for you too. So maybe introduce specific case studies. Here's an individual who's your age, who's doing the same things that you do, who was also affected. Something like that. Um, but there's always challenges with prevention programs.